Hello and welcome to the Spike podcast. I'm Fraser Myers. No Tom Slater this week, but I am delighted to be joined by Spiked columnist Ella Whelan. Hi. And trade unionist and commentator Paul Embury. Hello. So absolutely loads to discuss on the show today. We'll be talking about another momentous week in US politics with Joe Biden stepping out of the presidential race and handing over the baton to Kamala Harris. Plus, we'll be discussing the riots in Leeds and in Dublin. And finally, the BBC's very creepy obsession with drag queens. So if you're a fan of the show, make sure you subscribe to this podcast so you never miss an episode. And if you click the bell, then you'll be alerted every time there's a new one. So Joe Biden stepped down at the weekend. Um, probably more accurate to say that he was pushed. I think, Ella, what have you made of sort of the tone of the coverage around that? We'll come on to Kamala in a minute, but it's it, it's strange how he's being lauded as this, you know, great statesman, doing the right thing very selflessly, as if we haven't just had the past few weeks of people calling for him to go. Mm, I think it's just, it's remarkable how powerful the democratic machine is and how tightly it can turn things around. Because, you know, in the space of days, you had, you know, prominent democratic supporting commentators, things like that, writing op-ed saying, this is disgraceful. He, you know, he has to go really turn the, the kind of, there was quite a vicious turn on Biden after mm. that uh, crazy interview uh, debate with, with Trump, where he sort of really was on display for how far his problems <laughs> had got. Uh, and then once he had been, I, I, I'm assuming we can say pushed. Uh, yeah. I don't think it was, you know, the fact that he was saying only God can make me change my mind or something like that yeah. right up until the last minute makes you think that someone must have forced his hand. And then within an instant, the script completely changed to what a wonderful man to, um, you know, really sacrifice himself for his country and all this kind of thing. And I, I, I do think it's it's unsurprising because this is what people do in politics and, you know, spin and manoeuvring and operating is the norm and whatever. They, you know, they, they weren't exactly going to come out and trash Biden because that wouldn't look good. But we have to remember that the, the this whole sort of scandal of Biden's um, inability to perform wasn't the fact that he was old and infirm. It was the fact that the Biden administration behind him was obviously lying, gaslighting yeah. the nation and and expecting people to lap it up. And that's exactly what they're doing now. You know, they've and there's it's gone over the top talking about how his legacy will be in the history books. He's, you know, forgetting the fact that he was, you know, president throughout the COVID years, which yeah. was you know, one, he wasn't very good and two, he wasn't very remarkable. So the idea that he would stand up next to, and people were talking about comparing him to Roosevelt and things yeah, like that. Yeah, the second coming It's just FDR, insane. Yeah. And, and it's worth, you know, looking back just a couple of weeks ago, uh, before that debate, that was only three weeks ago, roughly now, um, it was essentially disinformation to say that maybe, you know, there are concerns about Joe Biden's health. And it was only when it became undeniable that, you know, the Democrats started moving. I actually want to show a clip just to remind people of how bad it got, you know, in the in the liberal media. The president's very sharp. He is so sharp and he's on top of everything. He's far beyond cogent. In fact, this version of Biden intellectually, analytically, is the best Biden ever. So that was that was uh, Joe Scarborough of M MSNBC, probably trained in the Pyongyang School of Journalism, <laughs> judging from that. I mean, Paul, what have you, what have you made of this? I mean, you, you're getting whiplash having to, you know, contort whether one minute Biden's brilliant, the next he's infirm, and now he's brilliant again, and we should, you know, praise him for his, uh, his selflessness and statesman, statesmanship. Well, I, I think... It was obvious two years out from this election that he wasn't fit to run again. Mm. Um, and I, I just found it staggering that elements of the, the media um, and the commentariat, both I think in America and in this country to a certain degree, were, were denying that. And I remember watching TV clips of him a couple of years ago. Uh, and I, in fact, I remember giving an interview on TV two, maybe three years ago 
um, where I made the point that he he is clearly mentally frail mm. and physically infirm. Uh, and I felt then, and I think I said then, that it was inconceivable that that this guy is going to stand again for president. And obviously, as the last couple of years have progressed, so has his deterioration. Yeah. And it just became even more and more obvious. And I remember as the election was approaching, thinking he is surely going to have to say at some point, look, I recognise what you can all see. Um, I'm, I'm not physically capable uh, and you know mentally capable frankly of carrying on and and actually i just felt it was cruel that people clearly were pushing him to to carry on and i, I mean him no kind of ill will as a, as an individual good luck in his retirement however many years he's, he's got left and whatever i think he's done some reasonable things as a president on on the economy and what have you um but it was just blatantly obvious that, that he wasn't capable of carrying on. And you do you do kind of wonder, without getting into the whole area, area of conspiracy theories, you do wonder if it did suit some people within the US administration to have someone in charge who clearly was not on top of his game, who was quite pliable, who they probably could manipulate. You know, his, his memory was obviously shot on certain things. Um, and you just wonder if there was some of that going on where they thought, you know, we've got we've got a man here who who we can effectively control if we want to. Uh, and even right up until the last days, you know, the fact that, that there were some people uh, in the Democrat Party and beyond who were denying what was obvious to everybody yeah. else. Um, it was a lesson really in, in how, I'll use the word, you know, gaslight. And it really was a lesson in how elements of the media really did try and gaslight millions and millions of people. Yeah. And I, I feel almost, you know, perhaps the more, um, the other explanation could just be, you know, they wanted to avoid any kind of serious debate within the Democratic Party. You know, having an open contest would lead to certain divisions being exposed. There is a, you know, there are divisions in the Democrats between um, sort of the left and the centre on economics, between the woke and the more moderates, and possibly keeping on hold of Biden for as long as possible, put a lid on those things. And equally, you could say now that they've all sort of, it's been agreed that they're going to back Kamala Harris, uh, that again, those, you know, those divisions can again have a lid put on them. I mean, Ella, we should talk a bit about um, the new candidate. She's already essentially got the backing of enough delegates for it to you know, it's not official yet, but she's the presumptive nominee uh, come August. What do you make of her? <laughs> well, what to make of her? I mean, again, up until this point, Kamala Harris has been something of an embarrassment even mm. to the Democrats because every time she seems to give an interview, which actually is quite rare. I know she, yeah. she isn't out there all the time um, doing public speaking because she's not very good at it. <laughs> and she has this sort of strange phrase, the the, um, the, the unburdened thing. Yeah, I can't even yeah, remember what? it. So what is it? <laughs> well, <laughs> um, but we can be what unburdened by what has been. Yeah. It's is, like, uh, it's, it's, which is an interesting phrase because it doesn't really make sense. But then when you think about it, the idea that you would not be burdened by the past is actually contrary to a lot of the stuff she uh, signs up to, whether it's sort of like Black Lives Matters protests and all the rest of it. But anyway, she's confusing. She you know, mm. says stupid things about Ukraine. She's you know, embarrassing on, on um, talk shows and things like that. And now suddenly she is this great hope. She yeah. is this wonder woman. And again, I get it. You know, th what else are you going to do when you're trying to win a presidential campaign? You obviously have to just uh, deal with what you've got. But she, as a candidate, she's incredibly poor. The only thing that she has ever been truly good at politically, the real success story of for her has been the fact that she was able to lock up so many young black men on Trump up drug charges. I mean, that is the sort of defining part of her career. Everything else has been a sort of period of uh, political social climbing. She's an incredible operator. She's yeah. managed to work her way up to the top um, of the Democrat Party and and, you know, in some ways, I think it tells you a lot about that, what I call the machine, the whole way in which that political system works. That all that being said, I do think that she's got a fair chance because for a number of things, I think Trump has really handled badly the Biden-Harris uh, sort of transfer. He was on a high mm. with the shooting and sort of being Mr. Conciliatory and all the rest of it. And I think he just was too open about the fact that he was devastated that Biden was was going and his easy chances <laughs> there were shot. Um, and I, I think he was sort of almost ungraceful in the way in which he, he dealt with that. I think that will put off some voters. But also, you know, 
don't underestimate the power of the gaslighting media <laughs> and all the rest of it. You know, the news out now is that Charlie XCX is, which for anyone under, well, actually, no, she's a millennial thing, but is a pop star who's declared Kamala Harris the brat, which is like saying she's the it girl. And suddenly Gen Z are really excited by her. So all of that it is a weapon that actually Democrats can and have in the past used quite strongly. So I, I just, uh, anyone who thinks that Trump's got it in the bag because Kamala Harris has got a few gaffes on television, I don't think it's going to be as simple as that. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm sort of in two, two minds about it because, um, yeah, as you say, you know, literally anything could happen in this election after this <laughs> past few weeks. Um, so, you know, it would be wrong to say that Trump has it nailed on. But at the same time, we did see, you know, with around Hillary Clinton, managed to get every celebrity endorsement, you know, think of all of the kind of fawning over her. You wonder if they, they I do wonder if some of the Democrats have talked themselves into, um, you know, they're believing their own hype, so to speak. I mean, because you read some of the, you know, papers and, you know, you read the New York Times, you watch some of the news coverage, you'd think that this woman is a cross between Martin Luther King and Beyonce, <laughs> rather than, you know, a no mark who, it's extremely unpopular with voters. I mean, it's worth looking back to 2020 when she actually ran um, for the Democratic um, nomination. And she had to quit, you know, two months before the first vote because she was going to face utter humiliation. Even in her home state of California, voters didn't really, really take to her. Um, and everyone knows, I know it's now gauche to say it, but everyone knows she was chosen to be Biden's vice president because she was a black woman. Everyone admitted this at the time. You can go back and read the New York Times saying Joe Biden's excited to pick a black woman when he's choosing his nominees. Now it's sort of considered racist to say that, but we know we know why she's why she is where she is and, and we know that she doesn't have many other good qualities, unfortunately. Paul, what have you made what have you made of the Kamala yeah, choice. I, I, I mean, I, I don't think she's particularly distinguished. Uh, I, I think there's this kind of myth that has, that has got up that she's, you know, somehow she's fought against the establishment to mm. get to where she is. She's this sort of great anti-establishment character, this, this anti-establishment figure. But actually, when you look at her backstory, I think she's she's actually very much part of the the establishment, certainly what you might call, you know, the, the new establishment and, yeah. and is, is quite conformist and, and arguably has been helped um, for large parts of her career um, by that new establishment, if you like. And on the on the rare occasions that she's been challenged, you mentioned 2020, for example, uh, has been has been found wanting. Um, and I, I think probably a kind of product of DEI, really. And I don't, don't doubt that she's got, you know, some good personal qualities. I think that's probably undeniable. But uh, you know, let, let's let's say how it is. Would not be the anointed one. Probably wouldn't have been the vice president. Won't be the. Wouldn't have been the uh, democratic nominee for for president if she wasn't a black woman of color. Um, and you know, if she and I was reading something today actually where people were talking about the. Um, Trump's running mate, um, J.D. Vance, and, you know, talking about him being a man of the establishment and having white privilege because yeah. he's, he's a sort of white male. And arguably, actually, in today's world uh, and in today's politics, um, has probably had to fight harder to, to get to where he had, well, we, almost certainly, when you look at his backstory compared to Kamala Harris, who has, uh, who has got where she has got, I think, through conformity and, and being part of the establishment. I think the big challenge for her, assuming she she goes on to um, to be the candidate, is how can the how can the Democrats win back those millions of lost votes that they've shipped to, to Trump and the Republicans in recent years for the reasons that we know, similar to the reasons really that the Labour Party in this country have lost millions of working class votes to, to the Tories because the Democrats were, you know, adopted this kind of hyper liberal agenda, whereas yeah. Trump suddenly started speaking about the Rust Belt and the impact of globalisation and the new global market on some of those communities. The offshoring of entire industries and, and jobs and so on. Um, I don't see her as the person who's going to, to close the gap between the Democrats and those communities that have thrown their lot in with the, the Republicans. And in many respects, I'm not sure there is a candidate. I, I think the, the, the Democrats really need a, an entire kind of 
ideological overhaul before they can win those people back. So she's got an immense challenge. I don't think she'll win. I think yeah. Trump will probably win. Um, and then we're in for interesting times again. <laughs> Curse to live in interesting times. I mean, Ella, um, just want to come back on uh, something you said. You were talking about her record as, you know, a prosecutor. She very famously, um, you know, was quite a harsh prosecutor. I mean, the irony is, of course, she has completely flipped on her position since then, or at least rhetorically, mm. since the Black Lives Matter moment, she's tried to present herself as a great champion of criminal justice reform, of you know leniency uh, with regards to crime, things like that. I wonder if she's going to flip over again because there's also this attempt to present her as the prosecutor versus the criminal in the you know the felon in the name of uh, in the name of Trump. I mean, maybe this is just to sp speaks to the sort of emptiness of these kind of woke vacuous politicians. Well, Joanna Williams wrote a really good article uh, about Kamala Harris a while back looking at her um, career and her political history and detailing how, you know, for example, it wasn't just young black men that she was uh, hell-bent on locking up. It was pretty much anyone on the lower economic scale in American society, single mums with kids that were playing truant and anyone who found themselves in difficulty. Now she's able to say, I think Black Lives, for example, I think Black Lives Matter is a great thing for criminal justice. And, you know, this is something that we really should be talking about politically and supporting. And and the fault really isn't with her. The fault is with people who are, aren't saying, well, hang on a minute. Have you had an ideological change of heart? Yeah. Or are you just trying to ride the wave um, of support for this particular issue by completely reversing your position on mm. Uh, and th in that case, um, you know, black people's relationship with the justice system. So, you know, I suppose you have to ask yourself, what, is this sort of just your average politician spinning, which, you know, is Joe Biden did in his time. If you look back at his political career, it's a fairly hairy in places in relation to, again, young black men and um, the criminal justice system. Um, some, some, he was, for example, pretty hardline on things like immigration. And then when, during his uh, the initial presidential campaign and during his time as president, very much adopted the woke agenda and, yeah. and very much was sort of the, I'm the friend of the gay, black, lesbian, blah, 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 rainbow coalition. Is it cynical or is it actually just that the Democrats have decided that this is uh, this is where politics is at now? Because the, as Paul says, they can't win with your average working class voters or that section of American society. I'm, I'm not really sure. I, I think it'll be interesting to watch her on areas like abortion, for example, people forget how important the sort of suburban mom vote is and that kind of those big blocks of voters. And Trump for a long time has been able to kind of fudge his position on abortion. He's infamously sort of been all things to all men in different areas. He can't do that with J.D. Vance, who is an absolute diehard um, anti-abortion and very open about it. Kamala Harris has been uh, all right in a kind of pro-choice way. So it'll be interesting to see how, whether or not she can win over on some of those more substantial things. But at the, if, you, if the Democrats are just going to try and play this election as a sort of um, woke versus anti-woke or a f felon versus squeaky clean, hmm. it's not going to work, not least because all of these um, criminal charges against Trump are sort of slowly falling away. <laughs> yeah, definitely. This week's episode is sponsored by AG1. Now, I know we all need to pay special attention to our health, but sometimes sticking to healthy habits can feel like a real challenge. Or at least I used to think so until I discovered AG1. AG1 is a daily nutritional supplement that makes it incredibly easy to keep on top of your health. Just one scoop contains 70 high quality ingredients, all designed to meet your baseline nutritional needs. Lately, I've been enjoying AG1 with my breakfast. I just mix one scoop of AG1 powder with water, and in less than a minute, I have everything I need to seize the day. That's because AG1 contains a range of important ingredients. Pantothenic acid has helped me stay focused throughout the day. Niacin has helped reduce tiredness, and ingredients like copper have helped unlock important nutrients in all my other meals. But the most surprising benefit of AG1 is how much it's been supporting my immune system. The vitamin C and zinc in my morning scoop have made colds and flus much less common throughout the year, 
giving me way more time and energy to enjoy life. This all might sound too good to be true, but AG1 is one of the most trusted brands out there. Its team of world-leading scientists have a combined 100 plus years experience in fields such as longevity, preventative medicine, and genetics. They work hard to make sure that your morning scoop of AG1 is always getting better. That's just one of the reasons why AG1 is trusted by Olympians and F1 drivers. So if you want to replace your multivitamins and more, start with AG1 today. Try AG1 now and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free AG1 travel packs with your first subscription. Go to drinkag1.com slash spiked to take advantage of that offer. That's drinkag1.com slash spiked. Check it out. Towards the end of last week, uh, rioting broke out in the Hare Hill suburb of Leeds, there, it essentially seems to start with a row between a Roma family and social services. Eventually the police were called, but they were pelted with missiles. They retreated. The police car they left was flipped over and attacked. Uh, buses were set on fire. Delivery vans were set on fire. Thousands of people took to the streets. Paul, I mean, am I being too bleak in thinking that these kinds of scenes have become increasingly inevitable or we, we, almost we're becoming inured to them a little bit. <clears throat> I, I, we've always had riots in this country. Um, I mean, I, I remember growing up in the 80s, um, there were riots in places like Handsworth in Birmingham and Tottenham and Brixton um, and places like that. But what what kind of strikes me about certainly the the one in Leeds is some of those other riots. Not that I'm a kind of supporter of rioting, but yeah, some of those other riots, you you kind of sense that people had genuine political grievances. Mm. You know, there was a stop and search in Brixton. Yeah. Um, there was alleged police harassment in Handsworth and, and Tottenham and places like that and unemployment in Toxteth uh, and that people felt that kind of searing sense of grievance to the degree where they thought we want to go and take to the streets and sh smash a few windows, burn a few cars and whatever. Whereas I know ostensibly this this one in Leeds was was about, you know, children being removed from the family. But given that there were hundreds, possibly thousands of people who at some point attended those riots and took part in those riots. I can't imagine that all of them felt a deep sense of political grievance. I, I yeah. suspect most of them probably didn't even know the facts around it, probably didn't even know the family. And when you see some of the footage of it, what struck me was a lot of it just seems to be purely gratuitous. Um, lots of giggling, lots of kids kind of involved, some, a couple of women involved as well, and people filming it on their smartphones. Um, and that was, I, I found that disturbing because there, there was almost for many people, there was there was not even a, a cause to be there in the yeah. first place. Um, so I, I detected a kind of cultural shift in that regard. And you, you asked in your question also the, the, the issue about the police. I think there are serious, serious uh, questions for the police as well, because it did seem, I think they've kind of pretty much admitted this as well, that they they withdrew entirely from the area yeah. and actually weren't seen again until about, I think, four or five hours later. And you think, and again, you know, recalling my childhood, I remember the, the scenes of uh, riots in Toxteth and whatever, and, and just seeing the police with their riot shields and their batons and their riot helmets mm. and taking the bricks and whatever and moving forward and being pushed back. Whereas what seems to be the way now, and I'm happy to be corrected by any police officers watching, but what seems to be the way now is, oh, this looks a bit nasty. We'll just withdraw because yeah. we're probably the cause of it and we'll let them burn the place out and we'll go in a few hours later mm. and and kind of help with the clear up. Um, and then we'll rely on camera phone footage to arrest people sort of later in the week if we can. I find that really disturbing because you heard accounts from people on the scene saying we were left to our own devices, basically. Yeah. The place was in flames. They were setting light to, to, to cars and uh, flipping over police cars and they were setting light to buses and anything else they can get their hands on. And the police were nowhere to be seen. And actually, when you look at the footage, you can see some daytime footage because I think it started around about five o'clock in the evening and then nighttime footage. Uh, and in most of the footage I saw, there were just no police. You didn't kind of hear sirens in yeah. the background approaching. It was just literally 
literally the citizens themselves. So I think there are, you know, it was a really disturbing episode and I think um, serious questions for the police. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and it's interesting because obviously you can understand why they had to retreat in the first place, probably outnumbered. But, yeah, but get but back then, in pretty yeah, quickly. Exactly, yeah. it, it took many, many, many hours. And Ella, do you, I mean, I think, does it raise questions about integration? That, um, you know, we're talking about an area of Leeds that is extremely ethnically and culturally diverse. I think over 80 nationalities represented there. It doesn't feel, it feels like one of those places that is almost, you know, not integrated into Brit wider British society. I mean, that came across from me from the suspicion of the social workers, for instance. Yeah. From the suspicion towards the social workers, I should say, sorry. We, I think it, the the response to this also contains a lesson within it because there were some uh, pretty ugly knee jerk responses on social media from the usual types um, who had probably not seen many um, Roman gypsies before and assumed that this was a Muslim community yeah. and th the usual crap went out um, about integration. And the reason why that's so bad, other than being sort of, in many cases, blatantly racist, was that there is a serious discussion to be had about the idea of um, <laughs> diverse but d divided communities and, um, and uh, a lot of hostility to... Uh, not just authorities, but sort of normal ways of life. And obviously that might be particularly acute among the Ro Roma community for <laughs> various cultural reasons f for them. But there's, it, it, you know, it was interesting to, as Paul said, watching some of the footage to note that there were these counsellors getting involved. One of them was um, uh, a, a Muslim counsellor who was, you know, <laughs> sweat pouring off him trying to throw buckets of water on one of these buses asking i don't know where the police are and that kind yeah. of thing and there is just this i think there's this sort of paradox which is that there is a, a sort of a state overreach into the idea of multiculturalism and there's a big focus on the idea that we will everybody will get along and there's no sort of authenticity in community integration anymore everybody's very nervous about, about each other because we're told constantly not to be racist not to you know step out of line and yet that the actual sort of mechanisms of how a community runs are absent yeah um so you know people in authority whether it's the fire service or the the police or whatever being absent in events like that no one taking a lead and um you know, neighbours having to fend for themselves is the kind of thing that does breed resentment and that does um, hamper any sort of sense of social integration. I also think that, you know, we have to face up to the the issue, which is that we don't, we, we are unable to defend what it might mean to be uh, a citizen of Leeds as well as a citizen of the country at, yeah. at large. We, we're on a, you know, we've many, many times on this podcast talked about and, and, you know, written about on Spiked, the issue of a sense of national identity and unpicking how you talk about that without going down a sort of superficial flag, flag obsessed sort of patriotic route in the kind of nonsense way that it's talked about, but really thinking, what does it, what values do we hold? What do we think is right and wrong? And how can we inculcate that in, you know, people who are born here and people who come here and all the rest of it. And I think that the sort of febrile atmosphere that, a, that an event like Leeds reveals is, is a barrier to that kind of integration, but it's just a symptom of a larger failing. You know, yeah. the, this isn't happening for no reason. It's not just that the this group of um, of Romas decided we're going to riot tonight. There's, there is a big bubbling tensions happening. I mean, it happened in Leicester to mm. a whole different community for a whole different set of reasons, but the underlying causes are the same. There's a feeling of a sort of, um, there's no cohering, uh, factors or or genuine community. And mm. I think that's a problem. If you don't have a shared identity, you don't have shared responsibilities. Yeah. And I think it's, you know, the irony is that, you know, the British state actually is promoting these kinds of divisions through, you know, promoting an atomized society through, through multiculturalism. You know, the Leeds City Council put out a statement celebrating the diversity of the Roma community on, the, on that very evening, you know, which is such an odd thing to celebrate. And um, it's you know, just defensive. The, it just yeah. comes across as incredibly defensive yeah. and makes people more annoyed. Yeah, when when really you know you want people to yeah you want people to integrate. You want people to see um, value in their nation, value in their own community. So they're not you know let's not forget people are attacking their own community more than they were attacking the authorities or the powers that be in a in a, in a situation like this. I mean, Paul, do you think do you think multiculturalism is playing a role in in a lot of this? 
I, I think two things. I think, first of all, um, the, the complete lack of control over numbers in terms of numbers coming into the country contributes to uh, some of these, some of this fragmentation and atomization that you talk about. Uh, I've always said I'm pro-immigration, but like all good things, it needs to be regulated properly um, and it, it needs to be done in moderation. And when you have such a lack of control over numbers, it does make integration harder by definition. Um, it reduces, if you like, any incentive uh, on people to, to integrate if you get these communities, these paradoxically, these monocultural communities mm. um, kind of living in silos in what we are told is actually a, a multicultural country. Um, so I think that the question of numbers um, is an important one and, and we can't avoid that. Um, and also the, the, the whole kind of ideology of state-sponsored multiculturalism, which, which for me has, has always been about what I call the active promotion of separateness and difference, of actually saying, trying to, to reinforce to people the whole time, uh, look, you are, you are so different from everybody else in this country yeah. uh, and you know, you've got to celebrate your separateness the whole time. Um, and to, to kind of draw these distinctions and to, to uh, promote these distinctions between people uh, and to say how, how, you know, we should all celebrate those differences seems to me to have had the opposite effects of that intended. It has actually driven communities apart where they do actually feel pretty different and they don't particularly feel integrated and they don't necessarily share those common cultural bonds and, the, you know, that, that shared national identity. Uh, and, you know, those of us who argue that are always told, oh, no, you, you know, you're bigoted and, you know, multicultural culturalism is the enlightened way um, and I always respond, respond by saying to people well you know look at somewhere like Japan um, which doesn't obsess about promoting multi multiculturalism at every opportunity um, is proud to be Japan and you know is very highly civilized and law governed and fairly stable and free and peaceful society no one would seriously say that Japan is some sort of dystopian nightmare because it doesn't obsess about multiculturalism I think it is possible um, for a country to say look actually we've got a long established culture and that's the one that we're going to promote we absolutely defend your right in terms of freedom of worship and so eat the food you want and the clothes you want to wear. That's absolutely your call. But from a public policy point of view, we're, we're going to, to defend what is the long established culture of this country. And, you know, you're very free to, to come and join with us and share in it. Um, we've been terrible. We've been terrible at this through, through, frankly, cowardly politicians, I think, for so long. And socially and culturally, I think we're paying a huge price for it. And it's spilling out in, in places like Hare Hills and Leeds and, and elsewhere. Definitely. And Errol, I just want to talk a little bit about um, the latest writing in, in Dublin. Mm. Um, another sort of uh, centre for asylum seekers has been attacked. Uh, I think it was attacked four times in the past week. Is that is that right? Yeah, in a in a suburb of Dublin called Coolock. Um, since the beginning of the year, there's been some form of unrest there. It began as sort of overtly political, peaceful protests. There was various encampments because the plans were that this uh, factory site, large factory site was going to be earmarked for accommodation for asylum seekers somewhere in the region of between 500 and 1,000. It sort of varies the numbers, but a lot of people put it that way. In a place where Kulok is, um, uh, you know, the, the commitments was filmed there, if anyone remembers that 1990s film, it's, it's pretty run down, yeah. as many suburbs of Dublin are. Um, and the community was pissed off about the fact that this was happening. Peaceful protests were ignored, 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 ignored. Um, and they started to escalate. And in the last week, just gone, yeah, four arson attempts. Again, it seems to me unbelievable that the Gardaí couldn't manage, the, the Irish police couldn't manage to secure the area, <laughs> the fact that there was four arson attempts. Um, and the place is pretty much this sort of half destroyed and uh, running battles with the police, um, you know, tear gas batons, all the rest of it. But the uh, to come back to what Paul said about the difference between sort of political grievances and these sort of semi-social individuated outbursts, the, the the unrest in Kulok and similar things that have happened, quite violent stuff that's been happening, for example, in Taller pipe bombs, arson attempts further down the road in Wicklow and Newtown Mount Kennedy, 
they are deeply political because they're speaking to a, a big problem in Ireland, not just of numbers of asylum seekers. There's been 10,600 in the first half of this year. That's going to, you know, more than double probably at a time when there's a 250,000 housing deficit in a country that has 5.1 million people. It's mm. like... Tinderbox kind of statistics we're talking. But it's not just that. It's that in Ireland, if you think the British uh, media and the British elite are bad at the immigration debate, you want to go to Ireland, where it is impossible to even say the word immigration yeah. without being jumped on. The, the, the sort of the censorship around the issue is visceral mm. and it has driven people who have genuine concerns that you might agree with or disagree with about, you know, GP places, housing, all the rest of it. And I would always tend to say it's the government's fault rather than immigrants' faults. But no discussion has been had with those people. And there's only so much, so many times you can tell someone to put up and shut up before it starts to um, take on a different kind of tone. And it's a really big problem. I mean, there's there's glimmers of hope. The unusual thing about Kulak is that it got to such an extent that the um, Irish Prime Minister Simon Harris and the leader of the opposition, Mary Lou Macdonald, had to, it was Sinn Féin, had to go into crisis talks. And Sinn Féin has now come out and said there needs to be a new policy on immigration, that any of these sites should be put to public consultation before they're decided on. I have a feeling that's a load of... BS mm. and it's going to just be a sort of fob off but I think it's a record it's a it's a shift because it's a recognition that the Irish government has just been picking the most urban and deprived and the most rural parts of the country to just dump people which is unfair on <laughs> the asylum seekers who are suddenly being I mean it's, it's hard enough to be uh, you know London Irish going into a small town in Ireland let alone being from <laughs> yeah. a different part of the world because there's the, there's a big still a big issue of whether or not you're from the area and blow-ins and all the rest of it it's unfair on them and it's completely unfair on these communities many of whom will have had for example in a place where I live um, in Wicklow community hall that was promised and long fought over and planning permission and you know something the community really needed suddenly given over to asylum seeking accommodation so the whole thing is unfair and I think there's something really terrible about what's happening in Ireland but it's a really good example of how the the sort of silence around the issue of immigration can cause real problems. So finally I want to move on to something a little bit uh, lighter um, we've noticed this a few times on Spike done a few articles on it but the BBC has this obsession with drag queens and I'm not talking about RuPaul's Drag Race and you know various other entertainment shows but often you know drag queens have become the subject of so many BBC news profiles it's it, it's absurd so recently we had the example of how um, a news story about how the cost of living crisis is affecting drag queens in particular and um, preventing them from wearing their sort of fierce makeup and clothing and stuff like that but what do, what do you make of this what why is this tiny subculture, um, you know, a subculture within the LGBTQ subculture, <laughs> captured the imaginations of, uh, you know, the BBC news team of all people? Well, I'm, I'm just about old enough to remember Hinge and Bracket. Do you remember Hinge and Bracket? <laughs> <clears throat> um, and I mean, they were, you know, quite funny primetime TV when I was a kid. Um, and yeah, it was a genuine bit of comedy. But but you you just get the impression now that the whole thing. He has just turned into a relentless moral lecture, actually, mm. that it's no longer just about the comedy. It's about hectoring people um, on the whole kind of LGBTQ plus whatever it is nowadays um, agenda. Uh, and I, I suspect probably the simple answer is because, you know, the, the kind of people we're talking about see it as a high status opinion. Um, you know, they they think that by that by trotting out that particular opinion um, and by presenting drag queens and covering them in the way that they do, it kind of earns them social kudos uh, amongst their kind of very uh, liberal, progressive, radical friends. Um, and I think the rest of us kind of look at it and think, yeah, it's a bit weird, really. <laughs> you know, it, it's a bit weird that you turn what is essentially, certainly was when I was young, you know, a bit of a novelty act yeah. uh, into something that merits, uh, you know, a full piece on the BBC website or whatever about, you know, the, the cost of living and how it's affecting this group of people. Um, 
but you know, I, I, I think that's the reason that people think it uh, it earns them brownie points in terms of their political opinions amongst their peers, and that's the reason why they do it. Yeah, and it, and to underscore, like it really is relentless. You can read BBC news articles, and I mean news news articles, not just you know, it's not just a magazine feature about drag queen that dresses as Taylor Swift, drag queens from Northern Ireland, working class drag queens. <laughs> if there's a drag queen doing a gig above a pub, you can read about it in on the BBC. I mean, it's just absurd. Yeah, they, they, they had that one about the cost of living crisis. And I mean, you know, lipstick is getting expensive, so I can <laughs> sympathise. But it affects some people too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not just a drag queen issue. Um, but the, you know, the, the, the thing that's interesting to me is that... Uh, Good drag queens of the past, you know, people like Lily Savage, had a real, um, you know, sharp edge to them, mm. were very controversial. And I don't mean in a like wearing a dildo to read books to school kids kind of controversial way. I mean, like real political depth to them, actually. Um, and were the kind of things that you that would scare the pants off the BBC. Mm. And so the idea that the BBC is now trying to be the sort of home of drag seems bizarre to me because or or it's telling because it's sort of a co-opting of actually a subculture that was in large parts very working class, yeah. sort of working class men's clubs and that kind of thing or you know back rooms of pubs um that was very rude, very edgy, very on the fringes of society in a way that was genuinely quite exciting. Um and you know, there's still a lot of that now just because you have sort of people parading around in RuPaul's Drag Race, which I'm a fan of because I like reality TV and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, it's become very safe. It's become the kind of thing that you can read on, on the Sunday morning in the BBC because there's no, there's no edge to it. And I think from an artistic point of view, that's, prob that's a problem. Uh, and probably I'd say if you were a self-respecting drag artist at the moment, you might want to get famous and be on the BBC, but I'd steer <laughs> well clear because you just can't have that kind of edge when it comes to being, you know, related to auntie and the Beeb. But the, I think Paul's right. There's a sort of, there's a moral edge to it, but also, you know, the, the whole nature of the sort of trans debate has meant, has changed how people see drag yeah, because yeah. drag was never linked into the, contemporary LGB rainbow thing. It was very obviously men, often straight men mm. who had jobs, bricklaying jobs and all the rest of it, <laughs> who put on an act in, in the evening and they, and there was no pretense at the idea that reality was being changed. It was an act. It was, it was artistic. It was drag, you know? Yeah. And I think now you have a situation in which you, for example, <laughs> up for my 21st birthday party, I, we had a drag themed costume party and it was great fun. Doing that now, you'd almost be scared you'd be done for cultural appropriation <laughs> because you can't, you know, there is this way in which you can't talk about things as a performance anymore. Everything mm. has to be someone speaking their truth. So it's kind of depressing because yeah. I think that drag is still has the potential to be artistically very interesting. And let's not be sort of uh, like too intellectual about it, just good bawdy fun. Yeah. But the problem is that it's, it's become this thing that sort of got the tick box next to it for the BBC it's very safe and if you're the right kind of person you're meant to like it despite the fact that a lot of the drag acts on the BBC are really really not very good well it's, it's funny I mean talking about this is a it, it is a kind of identity in a way and and even like a couple of years ago actually even before the trans craze really took off you know the BBC did its every year it does its list of 100 women it always includes trans women but there was one year where it included Conchita Verst who is a drag act not you know not someone who believes themselves to be a woman literally someone who is performing as a woman treated as mm -hmm. as as such just got a flipping beard I mean yeah. that was the whole joke yeah. of, the, of <laughs> the drag act was the fact that there was no pretense to it and I often think it'd be interesting to see where any of this sort of shifting dynamics in the whole sort of trans wars gender wars issue is going because the group that has been kind of silent you've had women and lesbians coming out and obviously mm. talking about gender critical issues the group that's been kind of cowed into silence I think is the sort of drag community if you can call it that of which they I'm sure there ones. are lots of whom who are really pissed off by the fact that now everyone's obsessed about the trans issue mm. when in actual fact that's not what drag was ever really about thank you so much for watching the spikes podcast we'll be back next friday if you hit subscribe and click the bell you'll never miss an episode and in the meantime why not check out all of spikes other videos and podcasts on this channel and for more spiked content find us at spikes-online.com <laughs>